and where I had to figure it out. Um, I'll let you know. Or just do something like that. Okay. Okay. So just um, just to quickly review uh, what we were uh, discussing, if we rush through it, or at least we meaning the royal we here uh, rush through it at the end of last lecture. Um, we saw the fine structure of hydrogen. For the first excited state, three principal bottom number two. So, um, what we have in the absence of our relativistic corrections was an eightfold uh, degenerate. Uh, manifold of states with two s orbitals and two p orbitals, and m, the good quantum numbers here were n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. S is, of course, also a good quantum number. Okay, um, and then we added in the relativist corrections, which came in the form of the corrections to the kinetic energy and. Uh, Relativistic field corrections, uh, particularly the the Darwin term that affects uh, the coupling of the electron and positron, and then magnetic effects. Mag I mean, magnetic effects relative to electric effects can be thought of as relativistic effects, but we can just think about them as magnetic effects as well. And um, what we found is that if, if we just thought about the magnetic effects first, that what we saw was that we get a splitting here. With a new set of quantum numbers and a new notation that we uh, reviewed where um, so this is due to the spin orbit. Which is a magnetic effect. And uh, these, the new good quantum numbers arose because the spin orbit, that is to say the orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum are coupled together. So the new good quantum numbers uh, are not m sub l and m sub s, which are the uncoupled representation, but now we have j and m sub j. So uh, un with the spin orbit effect, let me just we have the coupled representation. That's the big quantum number. Where we discussed and reviewed last time that we could think of a state with a good total angular momentum and projection of total electron angular momentum along a given quantization axis as a superposition of the uncoupled basis weighted by the Kleb Gordon coefficients. And the Kleb Gordon coefficients tell us how to add angular momentum, and they satisfy a set of selection rules, right? The total angular momentum J can be between L plus S and the magnitude of L minus S, and the magnitude M sub J must be equal to the sum of m sub l and m sub s. Um, so here j is the quantum number associated with uh, I typically write my j's in units of h bar, so I typically write the h bars in 
Um, so we were able to just diagonalize the spin orbit interaction by just noting, re recognizing that this operator is a simultaneous eigenstate of this operator associated with coupled angular momentum. Okay, so this notation over here, we, when we're thinking about an electron orbital, one uh, in the context of including spin orbit, then instead of writing just the N and the L, we also write the J. So this is an orbital that involves spin, but spin and orbit couple. And we, these quantum numbers are typically uh, written as N, L, J. That's what this notation means. Okay? And then the S is, of course, a half. And the M sub J, well, these are degenerate states. Um, of course, the L equals 0 doesn't have a spin orbit coupling, but the L equals 1 does. And I can add a half or subtract a half, which is why J is either 3 halves or 1 half. Now, in the context of hydrogen, uh, uh, where we have this, or hydrogenic atoms, where we have a 1 over R potential, where we have this degeneracy in the L, there's this nearby S, S orbital as well. And we need to, to think about the actual splitting, we need to think about the other relativistic corrections, the Darwin term and the uh, uh, relativistic kinetic energy. And uh, you know, we found that when we put all that stuff together, that this stuff shifted, and these guys shift together, and we have <coughs> this plus Darwin and relativistic kinetic energy. And this is a reflection of the fact that the, uh, in the hydrogen atom, we still have this um, degeneracy because of the nearby L orbital. And at the end of the day, or S orbital, the energy only depends on the J quantum. So this is now degenerate. Now, that's not exactly true because if we really wanted to sort of look at um, this kind of scales that we're looking at here, where this, this splitting here is of uh, you know, order uh, some gigahertz, then we have, in addition, uh, a splitting. I mean, these guys get shifted a little bit as well by the lamp shift, but most importantly, there is no longer a degeneracy between the two S one half and the two P one half, and this is what we call the lamp shift. Okay? So this is what we call the fine structures uh, of hydrogen. Now one thing that we uh, that came up at the end of class that others were working, think about, you know, doing atomic physics with uh, the spectrum of other atoms, this near degeneracy of the, say, a 2s one half orbital with the 2p one half orbital is just not there at all. This is something, again, I want to emphasize. This near degeneracy between different L's for a given principal quantum number is only true for one electron atoms. If I have many electrons, I don't have a 1 over r potential anymore seen by the electron, because it's one of the electrons sees the potential of all the other electrons and the proton. And that totally changes the whole nature of the game. In fact, the splitting between the 2s and the 2p in sodium or lithium is about the same order as the splitting between the ground state and the first excited state. So we'll discuss that a little bit, but it's something that's often confused because we spend so much time talking about hydrogen that we think all atoms are like hydrogen, and they're not at all. OK? 
Okay. So we'll get to that. Of course, there's still the degeneracy in uh, the um, M sub J. So there are two J plus one different magnetic sublevels for a given J. And those would, in general, be split in the presence of a magnetic field. And that's one of your problems for homework, is to look at the so-called Zeeman effect that you remember is the interaction between the magnetic moment and an external magnetic field. Yeah. So if you were to specify the wave function in terms of R theta and I, yep. is this the spherical harmonics are now in terms of J and J and J? No, that's not correct. That's not true? No. Uh, the spherical harmonics are about the motion. They're not about the spin at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, the, this is still a P orbital. Uh -huh. So this is still, uh, but in fact, it's a superposition of different P orbitals. So for example, let's, let's look at an example. I wish I had such gordon coefficients off the top of my head, but I don't. Uh, Suppose I look at the 2p 1 half C with a given m sub j. m sub j, of course, would be plus or minus m. Okay? So what does this mean? This means n equals 2, l equals 1, uh, where s is a half. Um, And then j is a half, and mj is a half. Okay. Now this itself is a superposition with coefficients that I don't remember, uh, but with uh, something with with a um, n equals two, l equals one, l equals one, n equals. Uh, one s equals a half m sub s equals minus a half plus some other uh, I'll put the clip for a coefficient here j this is a half a half one zero a half or one one minus a of orbit and spin, weighted by clip orbit coefficients. These here are the radial wave functions, which are the same in this case, because L equals 1. Uh, no, sorry, yeah, this guy. And these are the spherical harmonics. So this is a y11 as a function of theta and phi. And this is a y10, but is a superposition of these. Uh, let, me, let me talk to these gentlemen for a second. If, if I close the door here, can you do your work? Or is it, um, is that, OK. So that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up, Aaron, because we're reminded what we're talking about here, because this is the kind of thing you need to do in your homework assignment. In order to calculate a dipole matrix element, the dipole moment of the electron depends on the motion, not the spin. So if we want to calculate a dipole matrix element between a some, uh, let's say we want to calculate something like this, right? This is an operator that is the charge of the electron times the position of the electron relative to the proton. 
And so to calculate this matrix element explicitly, we need to uncouple the states, write them in terms of the orbitals and the spins, and then look at the dipole matrix elements. Now we will see how tedious that is uh, in this problem set. I mean, you know, tedium is hard to do in homework. But anyway, um, there is, it's at some level, a smarter way to do that. And we'll get to it when we talk about, when we review the Wigner Eckhart theorem and the relationship between vector operators and uh, matrix elements of states with definite angular momentum. We'll get to that in a few weeks. Does anybody have any other questions about that? <laughs> okay. Good. Why did you only take two states? I mean, is it just for examples? Or is it These are the only two states that exist in this superposition. Oh, yeah, right. You don't want to Okay, because because I'm, I, the the L is fixed, L is one, and the S is fixed, S is a half, and I looked at a particular case where M sub J was a half, and we must have the sum of M sub L plus M sub S equals M sub J. So these are the only two states in the superposition which have non-zero vectoring coefficients. Good question. All right. Um, so, um, a, a question came up, I think it was last lecture, you know, we just kept it time already, about what the heck about the proton magnetic moment? I mean, we have this, we have the spin orbit effect, which had to do with this spin of the electron. What about the spin of the proton? Well, so what we just discussed, what is, is called the fine structure, in particular the fine structure in hydrogen in the first excited state. Um, but what we want to talk about today is hyperfine structure. Okay, so um, What is hyperfine structure? Well, hyperfine structure is basically um, all the shifts of energy levels due to nucleus. beyond point plagiostatics, point particle plagiostatics. So, say in hydrogen or in any of the hydrogenic atoms, we treat the nucleus as a point particle with charge Z times E, and then it creates an electric field, and that creates the binding of the electrons to the nucleus. Anything that has to do with the nucleus beyond that, we call hyperfine effect. So what are some effects? Well, we have the effect of the reduced mass. A point, uh, I should say, beyond point particle, electrostatics, point infinite mass particle. So remember we had this question about where the heck is the center of mass and the reduced mass. So anything beyond uh, treating the um, nucleus as having infinite mass relative to the electron uh, is part of hyperfine, what is called hyperfine structure, so the, the reduced mass effect, which we've talked about. There's what we had in our first homework assignment which is had to do with the finite uh, volume of this. 
And then uh, the most important effect in terms of the actual, these effects give rise to small shifts in the energy levels. But they don't change the basic symmetries. And therefore, they don't change the basic degeneracies associated with, uh, with um, the levels. However, the spin of the proton ha is the most important effect. Uh, or at least for lightish atoms uh, um, that can give rise. There's one other related effect uh, here, which has to do with the spin, which gives rise to magnetic effects. But when we treated the volume of the nucleus in our homework assignment, we treated the nucleus as a sphere. Right. So we had, still had spherical symmetry, and because we had spherical symmetry, we had still, you know, the, all the same kind of good quantum numbers. However, when you start getting to pretty heavy atoms, then the nucleus starts to deform in shape, in which case we know if I have like an egg-shaped nucleus, well, it wouldn't just produce an electric monopole field, it would produce an electric quadrupole field. So there's a related effect here, which is the quadrupole. Effect. In fact, I, I made a big mistake once in a paper recently I wrote, because, you know, I never, not, not, not being a real atomic physicist, you know, just playing one on TV, I never thought about the fact that atoms have you have to worry about this. And when you look at strontium, I wrote a paper about strontium, so we forgot all about that until we gave a talk about it. And then, yeah, OK, thank God we didn't submit it for publication, because that would be quite embarrassing. But it does matter when you start getting to heavy atoms. Um, but this is the dominant effect that we want to discuss today. OK. So let's talk about. Uh, the spin of the nucleus or the spin uh, proton. Well, again, if I think about the proton as a kind of spinning ball of charge, um, then with the charge E, then it has a magnetic dipole moment associated with it. Now, that's not right because it's not actually spinning. It's just, we call it spin. So there's a fudge factor that we call the G factor that corrects for what the actual magnetic moment is compared to what it would be had it been a spinning ball of charge. Of course, if we have a fixed angular momentum, and the angular momentum of the nucleus is traditionally called an I, um, then, uh, so for the proton, I is a half. It's just been one half part. It's not an elementary particle. Of course, it's made up of quarks. And then how the heck it gets to be spin one half is still kind of a mystery. I mean, some mix of what's going on with the quarks and gluons in there. It's one of the things that Professor Fields in our department studies. Um, but um, the uh, for a fixed angular momentum, the speed, the angular velocity, goes like 1 over the mass. So the current goes like 1 over mass. Therefore, the magnetic moment is going to go like 1 over the mass. That's why the spin of the proton is less than the spin of, and not the spin, the magnetic moment of the proton is a lot less than the magnetic for a fixed angular momentum. So the um, magnetic moment of the proton, we could write as the gyromagnetic ratio times the uh, spin angular momentum, which is the g factor of the proton times uh, E, the charge of the proton, h bar, over 2 mass of the proton, c. <coughs> I is in dimensionless units, I in units of h bar. And this quantity is what's called the nuclear magnet.
Um, okay. So, uh, what is the G factor of the proton? The G factor of the proton is about 5.6. Where that comes from? Still a mystery, exactly. Um, more generally, one often talks about a nucleus beyond proton. And when we write the magnetic moment of the nucleus as the G factor associated with whatever nucleus you have, whether it's a deuteron, the alpha particle, or the cesium nucleus has its own G factor. Um, times the nuclear magneton. Which are measured quantities, not calculated. That's correct. Yeah. To my knowledge. I mean, I don't know anything about nuclear physics really. Well, I, I know something about nuclear physics, but not a lot. Not a lot. And uh, so I don't know exactly, but they just they are measured quantities. And the spin of, of course, higher uh, atomic number um, atoms is made up of the neutrons and protons. Neutrons have spin, even though they don't have charge, they still have uh, magnetic moments. And uh, so the, new, the, the spin quantum number of other atoms is not necessarily half. So for example, in cesium, the spin is seven halves, the standard non-radioactive isotope of cesium. All righty. Um, so let's see. So now the question is, the fact that the proton has a magnetic moment means that there are magnetic interactions that be with the magnetic moment of the proton that are due to the fact that we have this little magnetic dipole moment. And there are basically, uh, so there are two effects. So magnetic interactions between the electron and proton spin. Um, so there are two effects. Firstly, if I just think about this in a kind of, there's some orbit of the electron. Of course, the electron is an electron cloud, but you can think about one particular orbit, and then the probability distribution of all the orbits in the orbit tau. Uh, and then there's this proton sitting in the, in the center here. Now, this electron creates a current loop. And that current loop makes a magnetic field. And that magnetic field then interacts with the little bar magnet that the proton spin is. So there's an interaction that has to do with the orbit of the electron with the spin of the proton, right? And we all remember from uh, electrostatics what the magnetic field is for a current loop is, right? Maybe. Um, better study for your prelims. Uh, so um, what is that? Well, I can think about this as making a magnetic moment. So the magnetic field, uh, due to the electron motion, at the origin is twice the magnetic moment associated with this current loop due to the electron motion divided by this radius Q. So this, the magnetic field that, well, it's going into the board here because the electron got this negative charge, uh, is interacting with the magnetic dipole moment. So the first effect, let's call this effect number one, is minus mu v, I mean mu proton dotted into this uh, 
electron motion. Um, and that is equal to minus two mu proton dot mu electron <coughs> orbit over R cubed. The, you know, this again in CGS units, the magnetic dipole moment has the same units as the electric dipole moment. It's charge times distance. So charge times distance, charge squared, distance squared, charge squared over distance is an energy dipole, dipole over distance cubed. If you want, there's a mu nine over four pi out front, but I don't want. Um, so uh, now what is the magnetic dipole moment associated with the motion of the electron? This is equal to, uh, <coughs> well, this is just the Bohr magneton times the orbital angular momentum with no g factor because it's just orbital motion. So that really is, there's no mystery. That's real spinning, meaning real moving charge. So that's, that's what it is. And it's negative because the electron charge is negative. So this is then equal to uh, twice the, uh, or four times. the g factor of the um, proton times mu b <coughs> mu n over r cubed. Oh no. Well, where did I get that for? No wonder. Okay. There's no g factor for the electron. Okay. All right. So uh, times the spin dotted into the orbit, spin of the proton dotted into the orbit. Okay, so that's one effect. For how um, well, how big is this term? What kind of perturbation are we talking about? Well, the question is, how big is this energy? So in atomic units, the Bohr magneton is like alpha times the electric dipole moment. This is always a useful comparison. If I have a charge and it's moving, and I want to know what's the di electric dipole moment compared to the magnetic dipole moment, the ratio then is the ratio of the speed to the speed of light. Okay. In CGS units. So that's this thing. Then we have the nuclear magneton is the same thing as the Bohr magneton, but there's a ratio, remember the Bohr magneton has the electron mass here, not the proton mass. So we just need to scale the uh, electron mass over proton mass times the same thing again over a not cubed. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, this is alpha, this is the mass of the electron divided by the mass of the proton times alpha squared times the heart tree. So this energy was related to the fine structure splitting. The hyperfine, one at least this term in the hyperfine uh, splitting is reduced compared to the energy scale associated with the fine structure by the ratio of the electron mass to the proton mass. And that's a, you know, about 1 over 3,000. Which is why this is not just fine, this is hyperfine. Okay? 
So this is what we call hyperfine energy. All right. Um, so that's one effect that uh, we need to consider. Um, but um, the, there is also an effect, which is the magnetic dipole moment of the proton, or nucleus more generally, is a source of magnetic field. <coughs> That's to say, the um, proton is a little bar magnet. So it creates a magnetic Dipole field. Okay, so there's the proton. And the electron is sitting somewhere. Of course, it has a probability distribution of being somewhere. And it's got some spin. And so there is an interaction between the magnetic field arising from the proton, which is arising from the fact that the proton has a spin interacting with the spin of the electron. So, what is that? Well, the uh, magnetic, so th this interaction um, is the uh, magnetic moment, the spin magnetic moment of the electron interacting with the protons magnetic field due to the spin of the proton at the position of the electron. Okay. Now, of course, there's another effect, which is the fact that the proton is moving relative to the electron, and the proton creates a current loop as seen by the electron, and that current loop in the frame of the electron interacts with the spin of the electron. But we already did that. That was the spin orbit coupling. Okay, so that's a, that's a different effect, but we've already treated that one. And that term was of order alpha squared times the heart rate. And there was no ratio of, the, of the, those masses there, because it had to do with the electron uh, spin alone and not, had nothing to do with the proton spin. All righty, um, so what is this? Well, the magnetic field due to the spin of the proton is the, a magnetic dipole field, right? And that is equal to uh, 3, the spin magnetic moment of the proton dotted into the radial coordinate. Radial coordinate minus the of the proton. Um, just double check something, right? Um, e R is just the unit factor. Yes, E sub R is. I don't like to put R hat because R hat means something else. So I always use unit vectors with little e's, like out of Jackson's textbook. Um, That's the magnetic dipole field, right? Remember that. Um, and then this interacts the mu of the, the electron due to its spin. We just said it's minus twice the Bohr magneton times the spin. 
and the mu of the proton is the g factor of the proton, the nuclear magneton I. So this effect is equal to uh, minus 2 or 2 g proton um, or magneton nuclear magneton <coughs> times s dot i minus um, s dot e sub r i dot e sub r Okay. Um, three. There's a three. <clears throat> so not okay. Now it's okay. All right. So this, of course, is of the same order. It's of the order of the product of the Bohr and nuclear magnetons divided by the distance cubed. So it's the same scale of energy. Now, this is actually not exactly correct. This is only true for r not equal to 0. When r equals 0, something funky happens. I mean, this thing blows up in a weird way. And in fact, if we thought about the nucleus having a finite radius, and think about the nucleus as being a uniformly magnetized sphere, then we know, you know, this is some standard problem at Griffiths, what the magnetic field is associated with a uniformly magnetized sphere. Inside it's uniform, and then outside it becomes this dipole field, right? You remember that problem? Uh, So, um, near the origin. So, if I thought about the nucleus as a uniformly magnetized sphere. Then inside we have this so if we treat the nucleus as a uniformly magnetized sphere, then the B field inside is you know over four pi times four pi over three times the magnetization where n is the magnetic dipole per unit volume. Now if we take the limit and forget about the fact that this is a finite radius, and ignore, in this context, the finite nuclear volume effect, then we take the limit of this as the radius of the sphere goes to zero, in which case the volume becomes a point. And the volume of a point is zero, so one over the volume of the point is a delta function. So we will write this as So there is an additional term here, uh, which is if I factor out now the, the magnetic moment, that's the spin. Uh, so this becomes four pi over three s dot i 
times the delta function at the origin. Okay, away from the origin, this term is zero. Uh, I guess it's got to be it min it's minus. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Like a correction Sorry. Like a correction to the Uh, well, it it's um, it does in fact contribute with the Darwin terms, but in a different way because the Darwin terms were independent of spin. So the Darwin terms cause an overall shift to the ground state. But as we'll see, this has a more profound effect, much more important effect, in changing the degeneracy and structure, absolute structure, and giving hyperfine structure to the ground state. The Darwin term just with some tiny shift. Yeah. It's actually bigger than this, but uh, it doesn't affect the structure. OK. so. Taken together, we have uh, now and I've gotten some signs messed up somewhere and I can't find it. In my, and I realize that my notes have oh, maybe it's right. Hmm. Well, word to the wise, there's some errors in the notes that are posted on the hyperfine structure. I, I, rec I recognized them this morning when I was writing, when I was reviewing them, and I will repost those notes and let you know that. Uh, but what do we have? The total now we have is the magnetic spin. or total proton spin hyperfine interaction. I'll call it HF for hyperfine is equal to twice the heat factor of the proton, the product of these, I'll put everything now in atomic units, factor out the distance or radius cubed, and then all of my radii and position will be in dimensionless units. This becomes L dot S plus I dot S. Minus S dot E sub R uh, I dot E sub R over R cubed plus 4 pi over 3 I dot S times the delta function at the R. state. 
hydrogen.
Um, we need to diagonalize this, which means we need to think about the matrix elements of this operator in the basis that's described. Now, all of those basis elements have the same orbit. They all have the orbital. So in the 1s, 1 half ground state, unlike what we were just talking about, question Aaron asked about are what are all the there's only one YLN, Y00, zero zero, and there's only one radio wave function, R10. So all of this one orbital. So all of our matrix elements uh, are going to involve firstly, before I think about the spin, we, we can think about uh, the orbital associated with terms, but everything is going to involve that kind of, every matrix element in the 4 by 4 matrix is going to involve this average over the spatial distribution. Now if I look at this, this is why I said I shouldn't have erased that picture, we had the magnetic field associated with the proton spin outside the nucleus was this dipolar pattern. And if I average this over the 1s orbital, I'm averaging something that's a dipolar pattern over a sphere. That average is 0. One way to understand that is that the dipolar pattern itself is Y1N. That is to say, this itself, the dipole pattern, is a YLN. The different components of a dipole are Y1, 0, Y1, plus 1, Y1, minus 1. And the average of one circle harmonic with a different circle harmonic will be 0. Okay. Another way of saying that is, is related to parity as well. So this term goes to zero. And all I'm left with is this term, if I'm in an S order. And this is what is sometimes called the contact interaction, because it depends on there being contact between the position of the proton and the position of the electron. So this then is equal to some constant we'll call A I dot S. That's the only operator that's left. Doesn't you know, recognize that for our hyperfine interaction we use all the time. Um, and what is A here? It's a constant. A is equal to 2 times the, in, in atomic units, the g factor, the fine structure constant squared, the ratio of the masses uh, times 4 pi over 3 times y10, I'm sorry, r10, the origin squared and the square of the YLN, which is 1 over 4 pi. Okay. 
it's then you just have to figure out that number, which, which we will at the end. All right, so now we have a nice Hamiltonian to diagonalize. What we've done is uh, we've averaged now over the spatial orbital, and we need to consider the spin degrees of freedom, the spin of the electron, and the spin of the proton. So, uh, in the 1 s 1 half subspace, we have four basis vectors. For simplicity, let me mark them like this. spin down for electron and proton. The proton, I put a little slash through. Okay, so this is the electron, and this is the proton spin quantum number. Is that clear what that crazy notation means? Someone agree? All right. So, um, so what we need to do now is diagonalize this operator in the spaces, which we could do. Uh, we could do it in a very tedious way. We could uh, write um, this as the x, y, and z components. Write the x, y, and z components. Well, the z components, either I can say to the z components, and then the x and y components are raising and lowering operators. We have to write it all out. We have to take all the matrix elements. We have to write out a four by four matrix and diagonalize it. But we shouldn't do that because we can see, in the same way that we had the L dot S interaction, and we're able to <coughs> diagonalize that just by I, now we have an I dot S interaction, which we could diagonalize by I by going to the coupled representation. Just like we have with L and S. Now, um, the convention is, if notationally, in atomic physics, we define F as the sum of the nuclear spin and the total electron angle in the state. That's what F is. In this case, here, in the, in the, when we're talking about it, in the ground state of hydrogen, where L is zero, L is zero. So it's also I plus S when we're talking about a state with L equals zero. So the coupled representation of I and S are the eigenstates, the good quantum numbers, so the mutually commuting operators.
are the magnitude f squared, the magnitude i squared, the magnitude s squared. Of course, each one of these is where uh, the final number are half, so those are fixed. And then f z. So the good quantum numbers here are f, m sub f, i is a half, s is a half. We typically don't write those because you know we know that. We don't need to write it down every time. So those, I claim, are the eigenvectors, just like we had before. Why? Well, because this commutes with all of these operators. So this is a mutually commuting set that commutes with the Hamiltonian and thus defines the eigenvalues. What are the eigenvalues? Well, to do that, you do the same trick you always do. You look at f squared. f squared is, in this case, in the context of the system with uh, L equals 0, is equal to i squared plus s squared plus 2 i dot s, and thus i dot s is equal to a half f squared minus i squared minus s squared. So what are the eigenvalues associated with the hyperfine perturbation in the ground state of hydrogen? Or more generally, the a hydrogenic atom. Of course, for different hydrogenic atoms, this constant A will be different, but the form will be exactly the same. Um, eigenvalues of the hyperfine Hamiltonian in the 1s ground state are the shift in the energy of the hyperfine energy depends on f alone. Of course, i and s are fixed but f can vary, and it's equal to a over 2 f f plus 1 minus s s plus 1 minus i i plus 1. Let me write this just more generally like that. In the context of hydrogen, s is a half and i is a half, in which case each of these guys is three quarters. So this then is equal to minus is a over 2 f, f plus 1 minus 3 fourths f plus 1. Okay, good. So, what are the possible values of f in the 1s, 1 half ground state of hydrogen? f is the sum of i and s. So f can be between i plus s in magnitude and i minus s. So what are the possible values of f for the ground state of hydrogen? degeneracy. And what is, so for f equals 1, um, we get a minus 3 quarters. So the shift is uh, a minus 3 quarters 
for f equals 1. And for f equals 0, the shift is, I guess, no, sorry, a over 2. Uh, the shift is minus 3 fourths. Okay, I say four by root two. So it's confusing because it should still be proportional to a, right? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh! That's just that thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, I screwed this up. Sorry. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. That's what that that that's what messed up. Sorry. Uh, so. Let me write this. That's what it is. So that's uh, three fourths. No, no, but they're each one, the three fourths and three fourths add together to be three halves. So that is correct. Okay. So then we get uh, for f equals one, we get. Uh, Four halves minus three halves, uh, one half, so it's a over four, and minus three fourths a. That's good. That sound that looks familiar. So, what we see here is that the, the um, two s one half round state. I'm sorry, the one half round state, which was fourfold degenerate now gets split into a manifold of states with f equals zero, there's only one, m sub f equals zero, and an m sub f equals minus one, zero, and plus one. And the splitting here in hydrogen is 1.4 gigahertz, a lot smaller than in cesium, um, which is uh, in wavelength 21 centimeters. So of course this is the source of radio astronomy. In it's out there in outer space, you got this pretty cold hydrogen, it's pretty much in the ground state, but it could have this amount of energy around it. If some of those hydrogen atoms collide with one another, you can get an emission of this radio frequency from time. So this is what we call hyperfine splitting. Let me just quickly sketch here the excited states of hydrogen and put in the so now we can finally write down, in some sense, the real hydrogen atom, including all the important effects. I mean, there can be tiny, tiny effects due to, you know, coupling to the weak field. But these are the dominant effects that are resolvable uh, in terms of the splittings. So, the real hydrogen atom. Um, so we said we had the 1s, 1 half round state, which got split up into an f equals 1 and an f equals 0 hyperfine control. We have the excited states now. This is all the n equals 2 manifold, where we have the 2p 1 half now gets split up into 
and f equals 1 and then f equals 0. The 2s 1 half gets split up as well in terms of these. Be done in one moment. Uh, and you can go ahead and get started. You just don't use this doors all. Okay. Um, And now I ask you, what are the possible values of f in the 2p3 halves? Well, j in this case is 3 halves. And the nuclear spin is 1 half. f was j plus i. So I can have 3 halves plus 1 half, which is f equals 2. And f equals 1. Okay. In, in this case, the hyperfine splitting, the ratio of hyperfine splitting in the excited state to hyperfine splitting in the ground state, it's about a factor of a third less. We'll talk about this for other atoms like alkali atoms, where the ratio is much different, where the ground state splitting is huge compared to the excited state splitting in terms of the hyperfine splitting. Um, could be you know, factors of 20. It sort of depends on the alpha line. And then, of course, each one of these states has m sub f magnetic sublevels. Within them, in this case, I would have a five-fold degenerate manifold, a three-fold, three-fold one fold, et cetera, et cetera. And those levels could be split in the presence of a magnetic field, for example. All right. So we're finally done with hydrogen. And next week, we'll start talking about multi-electron atoms. All right. And uh, these, the new good quantum numbers arose because the spin orbit, that is to say the orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum are coupled together. So the new good quantum numbers uh, are not m sub l and m sub s, which are the uncoupled representation, but now we have j and m sub j. So uh, un with the spin orbit effect, let me just We have the coupled representation. That's the big quantum number. Where we discussed and reviewed last time that we could think of a state with a good total angular momentum and projection of total electron angular momentum along a given quantization axis as a superposition of the uncoupled basis weighted by the Kledge-Gordon coefficients. And the Kledge-Gordon coefficients tell us how to add angular momentum. And they satisfy a set of selection rules, right? The total angular momentum j can be between L plus s and the magnitude of L minus s, and the magnitude m sub j must be equal to the sum of m sub L and m sub s. Um, so here j is the quantum number associated with uh, I typically write my j's in units of h bar, so I don't typically write the h bars in. Um, so we were able to just diagonalize the spin orbit interaction by just noting, re recognizing that this operator is a simultaneous eigenstate of this 
operators that wanted to sort of look at um, this kind of scales that we're looking at here, where this this splitting here is a uh, you know, order uh, some gigahertz. Then we have, in addition, uh, a splitting. I mean, these guys get shifted a little bit as well by the lamp shift, but most importantly, there is no longer a degeneracy between the 2s, one half, and the 2p, one half, and this is what we call the lamp shift. Okay? So, this is what we call the fine structures uh, of hydrogen. Now, one thing that we uh, that came up at the end of class that others were working, think about, you know, doing atomic physics with uh, the spectrum of other atoms. This near degeneracy of the, say, a 2s1 half orbital with the 2p1 half orbital is just not there at all. This is something, again, I want to emphasize. This near degeneracy between different L's for a given principal quantum number is only true for one electron atoms. If I have many electrons, I don't have a 1 over R potential anymore seen by the electron because it's one of the electrons sees the potential of the, all the other electrons and the proton. And that totally changes the whole nature of the game. In fact, the splitting between the 2s and the 2p in sodium or lithium is about the same order as the splitting between the ground state and the first excited state. So we'll discuss that a little bit, but it's something that's often confused because we spend so much time talking about hydrogen that we think all atoms are like hydrogen, and they're not at all. Okay? So we'll get to that. Of course, there's still the degeneracy in uh, the um, M sub J. So there are two J plus one different magnetic sublevels for a given J. And those would, in general, be split in the presence of a magnetic field. And that's one of your problems for homework, is to look at the so-called Zeeman effect that you remember is the interaction between the magnetic moment and an external magnetic field. And where I have to figure it out. Uh, I'll let you know. Well, just do something on that day. Okay, so just um, just to quickly review uh, what we were uh, discussing, if we rush through it, or at least we mean the Royal We here, uh, rush through it at the end of last lecture, um, we saw the fine structure of First excited state, three principal quantum number two. So, um, what we have in the absence of our relativistic corrections was an eightfold uh, degenerate uh, manifold of states with two s orbitals and two p orbitals, and, and the good quantum numbers here were n l m sub l and M sub S. S is, of course, also a good fun number. Okay? Um, and then we added in the relativist corrections, which came in the form of the corrections to the kinetic energy and uh, relativistic field corrections, uh, particularly the, the Darwin term that affects uh, the coupling of the electron and positron, and then magnetic effects. Mag I mean, magnetic effects relative to electric effects can be thought of as relativistic effects, but we can just think about them as magnetic effects as well. And um, what we found is that if, if we just thought about the magnetic effects first, that what we saw was that we get a splitting here. With
a new set of quantum numbers and a new notation that we uh, reviewed where, um, so this is due to the spin orbit. which is a magnetic effect associated with coupled angular momentum. Okay, so this notation over here, we, when we're thinking about an electron orbital, one uh, in the context of including spin orbit, then instead of writing just the N and the L, we also write the J. So this is an orbital that involves spin, but spin and orbit couple, and we, these quantum numbers are typically uh, written as N, L, J. That's what this notation means. Okay? And then the S is, of course, a half, and the M sub J, well, these are degenerate states. Um, of course, the L equals zero doesn't have a spin orbit coupling, but the L equals one does, and I can add a half or subtract a half, which is why J is equal to three halves or one half. Now, in the context of hydrogen, uh, uh, where we have this, or hydrogenic atoms, where we have a one over R potential, where we have this degeneracy in the L, there's this nearby S, S orbital as well. And we need to, to think about the actual splitting, we need to think about the other relativistic corrections, the Darwin term and the uh, uh, relativistic kinetic energy, and uh, you know we found that when we put all that stuff together, that this stuff shifted, okay, and these guys shift together, and we have <coughs> this plus Darwin and relativistic kinetic energy. And this is a reflection of the fact that the, uh, in the hydrogen atom, we still have this um, degeneracy because of the nearby L orbital. And at the end of the day, or S orbital, the energy only depends on the J quantum. So this is now degenerate. Now that's not exactly true because if we really yeah. So if you go to specify the wave function in terms of R theta and I. Yep. Is this the spherical harmonics are now in terms of J and J M J? No, that's not correct. That's not true? No. Uh, the spherical harmonics are about the motion. They're not about the spin at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, the, this is still a p orbital. Uh -huh. So this is still, uh, but in fact, it's a superposition of different p orbitals. So for example, let's, let's look at an example. I wish I had such Gordon coefficients off the top of my head, but I don't. Uh, suppose I look at the 2p 1 half so with a given m sub j. M to J, of course, would be plus or minus N. Okay? So, what does this mean? This means N equals 2, L equals 1, uh, of course, S is a half. Um, and then J is a half, and MJ is a half. Okay? Now this itself is a superposition with coefficients that I don't remember, uh, but with uh, something with the, with a um, n equals two, l equals one, l equals one, n equals uh, one, s equals a half, m sub s equals minus a half plus some other uh, I'll put the clip for a coefficient here. J this is a half a half one zero a half or one one minus a
Okay? So what have I done? What I have done is I've taken the coupled representation, 